Interesting insight, and those were just a few people on the streets of Beijing voicing their opinions about GMO foods. China recently approved the imports of two new varieties of genetically modified crops developed by U.S. companies. CGTN's Rochelle Akufo spoke earlier to Kent Bradford. He's a distinguished professor of plant sciences and the director of Seed Biotechnology Center at the University of California, Davis, about how Dow and Monsanto may benefit from this trade concession to Washington. Well, certainly it's, uh, it's important to the companies. It's, uh, it's also important to the farmers in the U.S. Uh, it's generally the case that when new varieties, uh, genetically engineered varieties, are released uh, in the U.S., they uh, may receive approval for commercialization, but they're not really released until the major market countries like China and, uh, and other countries, Japan and so on, actually approve as well. So what this means is that uh, now American farmers can have an opportunity to grow these improved varieties as well, and certainly the, the seed companies will appreciate that. Now, China is among several companies that are looking at GMOs as a way to really help as they see these growing populations and are looking for more resilient crops to help support them. But some people still have concerns. What do you think is really behind a lot of the hesitation to embrace GMO crops? Well, uh, several things. I think, uh, you know, there is uh, a certain hesitancy for new things, of course, but uh, my own view is that uh, we shouldn't forget there's been a very uh, dedicated uh, group of uh, people and, uh, and organizations that have worked very hard to instill that, uh, that concern and that fear in the public. So uh, it's not accidental. Uh, there are certain groups that uh, really uh, have from the very start opposed these, uh, these technologies and, uh, and they've been very effective. Uh, at the same time, it's been, I think, uh, more difficult for scientists and, uh, and advocates for this technology to uh, explain the science and, uh, and indicate how this is really just uh, a, a continuing evolution of plant breeding and, and uh, crop improvement. So then what are some of the ways that the government can still use these G GMOs as a way to boost uh, productivity on farms and, and make these more resilient crops while also alleviating some of the concerns that the public has? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think the government uh, has tried uh, the regulatory approach, that is uh, the original uh, releases uh, back in 1994 of uh, the flavor saver tomato, they actually sought government uh, regulation. There was no real system for it at the time. Part of the motivation for that was uh, to get uh, regulatory approval, that is have the government, uh, FDA and so on, uh, look at the crops and, uh, and give it a stamp of approval. Um, certainly that's still important. I think people still feel like uh, some oversight uh, is necessary and that's one of the ways that, uh, that government can help. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, I feel right now having 20 years plus of experience without any safety issues whatsoever, we're sort of in the opposite situation where the sort of feeling is if it has to be regulated, it must be unsafe. We saw that a court recently ruled in favor of U.S. farmers in Kansas that had alleged that Syngenta was careless in marketing um, one of their strains of their genetically modified corn seed, which farmers said contaminated their crops and caused their, experts to be, their exports to be rejected by China, which also then in turn lowered the price of corn. Now, Syngenta does plan to appeal this, but in terms of a potential headwind that this could be for some of these GMO companies and farmers who want to enter the Chinese market, how concerned should they be? Well, you can have different views on this. Uh, this is exactly the case that I mentioned where the real problems are not with the crops themselves, it's with the regulations that govern them in every different country. So each country has their own regulations and uh, companies who seek to market these products have to go and uh, get approval in every country that wants to import it. And as we just uh, were discussing, China uh, itself has to decide uh, event by event or crop by crop uh, what they will allow to enter. And until all of those approvals are in place, if uh, a truckload of grain gets into the wrong uh, uh, barge load or, uh, or container ship uh, to one of these locations, that causes uh, market disruption. I mean, it's really not a safety issue, but it is a market disruption issue. China is one of the countries that is embracing having some of the GMO products um, imported into the country. But in terms of the restrictions that still remain in terms of imports and also planting crops, GMO crops, within China, do you expect those restrictions to loosen over time? Well, uh, China is a very interesting case. Uh, I, I'm more of a scientist, and I'm well aware of the uh, very large amount of research that has been done in China uh, by their own scientists uh, across a whole range of crops. Uh, 
introducing traits that would be very valuable to uh, Chinese farmers and to consumers. Uh, none of those, as you say, are released for farmers to grow there, and, and it, only cotton, one crop, has been released uh, from anywhere. So I think it's really uh, a challenge that they have really uh, a huge investment and backlog of very useful things, but they're, they're cautious to let it out. Uh, China has an enormous internal market. Uh, a limitation, as we saw, for uh, countries where it's mainly exports that you're worrying about is you have to really deal with all of these uh, international uh, rules that every country sets up. But if you have a, a really large internal market, as China does, and, and you're not really uh, as focused on exports, then they can set their own rules for their internal uh, production, for their crops that they allow their farmers to use, and uh, mainly going to, uh, to local markets. So one thing that would do is it would allow consumers to get more comfortable, if you will, more familiar with seeing some of these crops and seeing that they're, they're just plants and they're just food and it's, uh, it's really not such a big deal. It could also uh, encourage other countries, India in the same case, they have many of their own products that, uh, that could be used there, but they're being cautious. Uh, and it could uh, push, uh, push the boundaries a bit for, uh, again, opening uh, trade um, uh, easier, more harmonization around uh, the world if, in fact, certain economies are, are using these crops more fully.